I'd like to invite the two moderators for the final lecture, uh, Echocardiographic Assessment of the Right Heart. Uh, may I invite Dr. Stanley Amrasekar, Senior Consultant Cardiologist, as well as Dr. Vasanti Ratnayaka, Consultant Cardiologist, to take the stage to introduce our um, guest speaker. Uh, let me introduce the le last lecture today, the Professor Julia Gapspa, uh, MD, PhD, FSCC. She's a consultant cardiologist at Guy Hwan St. Thomas Hospital in NHSL Trust. And she's a responsible for the valvular heart disease network and eto echocardiography, the which position was held previously by John Chambers. And uh, was chair of a young community and multidisciplinary imaging methods. And she's a member of European Society of Cardiology Education Committee and the chief editor for the JACC. Uh, I welcome uh, Professor Julia. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation uh, for the Sri Lanka College of Cardiology. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here in this meeting. Um, I hope that you are all well and, and safe. Uh, just to clarify, I'm the editor-in-chief for Jack Case Reports, um, which is a sister journal um, under uh, Dr. Fuster. And um, I would like to start this uh, lecture with the overview. So the most important when we are looking for the echo of the right heart, which is my favorite topic, is to understand the basics. So starting from the anatomy and physiology of the right heart, also then to understand the important markers of uh, right heart echocardiography. And I will separate these markers into prognostic and also that they have a prognostic importance for the right heart, even when it comes to pulmonary hypertension or after surgery, and also diagnostic so that they have a different sense of importance for us. Um, starting from the anatomy and physiology, we know that the right heart, now, they used to say uh, like 20 years ago, that is the forgotten chamber, but it's not anymore because it has uh, an incremental importance for uh, the surgeons, for the interventionists, for actually for even us as imagers, we always make sure that we will, actually, we will have a good screening of the right heart. And if you noticed, especially now with uh, COVID, uh, there was a great, uh, the studies have emphasized the importance of the right heart in uh, pro as a prognostic marker actually of those patients that they had um, as a kind of myocarditis or uh, impairment of the, of the heart in general. So the right ventricular anatomy is divided into three segments, the inlet, the trabeculate, the apical myocardium and the out outlet. And it's a highly trabeculated cavity. Uh, those that they are learning echo, sometimes they see the moderator band and they say, oh, what is this? But it's a normal uh, part of the right ventricle. And there is a septoparietal trabeculation. And if you know the right heart, you will know that it's very thin and it has a low pressure circulation. So normal pressure is less than 25 millimeters per mercury. That's why acute changes uh, when it comes to uh, afterload, for example, when you have a, a change in RV pressure volume relationship, then you will see the right heart that will dilate and it will become acutely uh, pressure loaded. It's also it's very important because the right interacts with the left through the interventricular septum. But remember this rule of the one third and the one sixth. The RV normally is, as you can see on the echo slide, is one third when compared to the left heart. And this is a normal RV. This is a normal RV, which is not pressure loaded, is not volume loaded, and the function is normal. And the RV mass is one sixth when compared to the left heart. That means exactly that. As you can see, I'm showing the RV mass from the MRI because it's a thin chamber and that's why it has the ca capacity to dilate, but also when uh, in, let's say, pulmonary embolism to go back to normal in, uh, when we have acute pulmonary embolism and we will thrombolize the patient. I'm giving you an example. And then uh, I will start with the main echocardiographic assessment of the right heart. So when we see the right heart for the first time, the first step would be a qualitative assessment. 
and we will see whether the right heart is dilated, hypertrophied, and it has a nice, good contractility. And you will see the studies that we have done, even in uh, with my with uh, our group, that when we have a volume loaded our vent right ventricle is very different when we have a pressure volume pressure loaded right ventricle, and this is very different from when we have a composite of pressure and volume loaded. And when do we have a pressure loaded our right ventricle? For example, when we have pulmonary hypertension, or when do we have volume loaded right ventricle? When we have significant tricuspid regurgitation or a shunt. So you will see that the, in volume loaded, the right heart may be dilated, but also it uh, will be not as much as hypertrophied as when we have pressure loaded right heart. The contractile reserve will be lower in pressure loaded right ventricle. Also the tricuspid annular dilatation is different because when we have significant tricuspid regurgitation, the natural progress will be actually for the tricuspid annulus to dilate and then the, the tricuspid regurgitation to become worse and worse and worse. Also the regurgitant volume is the same. The TAPSI that I will explain later is a volume dependent index. That's why it will be pseudo normal when it comes to volume loaded right heart. And also I will explain the rest of indices. Again, a very important component of the indices for the right heart is that we need to find the most load independent and heart rate independent um, index. And that's why, because when we use indices such as the acceleration time, the myocardial performance index, the S wave, or the isovolumic relaxation and contraction time, they are also, they have to be indexed for the heart rate. If the patient is running between 70 to 90 beats per minute, then it doesn't need to be indexed to the heart rate. But also remember that some indices need to be indexed for the body surface area. And this is started actually with very early in 2001, when Dr. Picard and uh, McKillan, they describe actually that right ventricular systolic pressure is highly dependent on the body surface area and age. That's why when we have, uh, for example, a 90-year-old patient with a right, right ventricular systolic pressure of around 40 millimeter, millimeters per mercury, we cannot establish that as pulmonary hypertension. It would be a mistake. Also, when we have an obese patient with uh, raised pulmonary pressures, again, this it would be a mistake to label this pulmonary hypertension. And for that purpose, we have also done, performed a study that uh, we had bariatric patients before and after surgery, and we saw a significant uh, difference in pressures, but also we had to index that for the body surface area. Here is the, as I described from the beginning, how we separate the indices for the right heart into prognostic and diagnostic. Prognostic, they have a special value for us because it has been proved through studies that they have, they're associated with uh, parameters with endpoints such as death, hospital outcomes, but diagnostic, they may not be associated with the outcome of death. However, they have a, a great sensitivity into diagnosing that to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. So starting from the basic principles of 2D, you need to know that the right ventricular outflow track acceleration time is suggestive of raised pulmonary pressures, especially when it's lower than 105 milliseconds. And also one of the greatest uh, people from in, in pulmonary hypertension, Paul, the Professor Paul Porfia from the University of Pennsylvania, he described in the 2005, 2007, and his latest paper in 2012, that the pulmonary systolic notch is immediately associated with pulmonary vascular resistance. And it's very important because if you see the difference here, look at this example. We have three patients. The first patient has a tricuspid regurgitant velocity of 2.1 and acceleration time of 160. That means that his right heart is normal. The second patient mildly raised pulmonary pressures, 2.8 meters per second, the tricuspid velocity, and the acceleration time starts to shorten 90 milliseconds. And the last patient has established pulmonary hypertension with tricuspid regurgitant velocity of five meters per second. And the acceleration time not only is 40 milliseconds, which is a bad prognostic marker for the patient, but also it is this systolic notch that you will see that means that the patient has very high pulmonary vascular resistance. So it's important as a first index to, to know the meaning of the acceleration time. The tricuspid annular plane systolic exertion, as we described as TAPSI, you will see that in many studies. 
and it comes from the four apical chamber view. Here I describe some technical tips in order to make the best of the TAPSI and make sure that you measure it correctly. Usually you zoom and then you measure the distance from uh, the base to the apex shortening of the right ventricle in systole. It's very important to control the sweep mode and to zoom in order to have accuracy in measuring it. While it has good correlation with the ejection fraction for, of the right ventricle from studies, its major limitation is that it's load dependent. That means that if you have mo more than moderate tricuspid station, you will have a pseudo normalized TAPSI. That's why when you have, especially patients that they're about to be operate for their tricuspid station, do not use TAPSI as a marker because I think it will be distracting for this, your surgeon or for your colleagues to, uh, to think that the patient has normal RV when they don't. So as you can see, uh, two examples here, clinical examples, uh, the 31 year old patient with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, severely impaired RV, and then you will see a TAPSI of 10, yes, because the right ventricle is pressure loaded. But a, a patient who 20 years old, 28 years old with mildly impaired RV systolic, patient, RV systolic function, the TAPSI was 30. And why it was so high? Because the patient has a shunt. She had the sinus venosus defect. That's why the right ventricle is volume loaded. So definitely it can be diagnostic, but it's not prognostic. So keep that in mind. I love the uh, right ventricular perf performance index because from one only view, when you take the TDI of the right ventricular free wall, you can have five different values. You can take here the isovolumic contraction time, the isovolumic relaxation time, and the ejection time. And when you divide the sum of the contraction time to the relaxation time to the ejection time, then you will have the myocardial performance index, which is suggestive of the degree of RV impairment. Also, if the S wave is less than 12, means bad prognosis. And if you have prolongation of the relaxation time, means early RV impairment. In fact, RV diastolic impairment. And from all the studies that they exist at the moment, if we accept, of course, RV strain, which is more sensitive, the isovolumic relaxation time is the number one echocardiographic index, which, which, which will change when you will have the first signs of pulmonary hypertension on the right ventricle. So it's a very early index. Also, MPI is independent of chamber geometry, which is very important. It is highly prognostic, and it, but it is heart rate and load dependent. So the S wave will be uh, influenced by the volume dependency. The RV systolic pressure, uh, as you know, it's coming from the Bernoulli equation. This is the first step of uh, when someone is learning echo. But remember that when we have free flow tricuspid regurgitation, we cannot apply the Bernoulli equation. Also, when we have pulmonary stenosis, when we use the modified Bernoulli equation, that we will have to remove the gradient from the pulmonic stenosis. Therefore, it is diagnostic. It will, of course, assess the first evidence of pulmonary hypertension. However, it is not prognostic because there haven't been studies that they correlate the right ventricular stolic pressure with the outcome of death. And also when it comes to the right atrial size, this is one of the echo indices that it was suggested by the EEC guidelines together with the pericardial effusion. It is prognostic in uh, right ventricular failure. You will see many heart failure studies that they use the right atrial size as a prognostic index, index for uh, patients, especially for hospital outcomes. There are multiple ways to to measure that. Actually, we wrote the chamber for ASC dynamic echocardiography on right atrial assessment, and we have volume, 2D assessment, and 3D assessment. But also, especially the patients that they are intubated, remember uh, about the IV, sometimes they will ask you to, to assess the IVC size and the RA pressure, and you cannot do the, this when a patient is intubated in ICU. But this is the rough assessment of the IVC diameter and uh, when it changes during respiration. So this is also one of the first steps of echocardiography. I will move to the advanced echocardiographic modalities. And one of the first steps that we did to assess uh, right ventricular volumes was to use 3D. And I've been using 3D since 2006, when we did the first studies with the first ever machine of Philips, I remember. And I did also my PhD with 3D on the right heart compared to the MRI. 
So in order to get a good 3D of the right heart, you need to go more lateral in order to get an on-axis view of the right heart to be able to have the whole chamber of the RV. Remember, the most common limitation of the 3D is that when you have a dilated right ventricle, it might not be able to get the whole of the RV apex. But if you adjust the depth and the width and you go more lateral, you most likely with a little bit of learning curve, you will actually get the whole of the right ventricle. Also, in order to have increased temporal resolution, try to increase your cardiac cycles. I haven't seen many studies in the literature using real-time 3D to assess the volumes, but we use four cycles in order to increase temporal resolution and avoiding stitching artifact. Then you take the full volume and you save the raw data, and then you do endocardial mapping, but the limitation here is that you exclude the RV RVOT. That's why MRI is an absolute indication when you have suspicion of RVOT pathology, and you include tribulations to the blood pool. From the endocardial mapping, you go to the epicardial mapping, and then it reconstructs from the short axis from base to the apex with seven millimeter slices. You get the myocardial volume, and when this is multiplied to the myocardial density, you have the myocardial mass. It is important to remember some tips and tricks for 3D. Uh, and this is, of course, when you, you have to include all the endocardium. You cannot cut the apex, otherwise you will have to repeat it, or you trust the MRI better. To Do not extend uh, blindly the RV outflow tract and try to, I know that they are automated softwares, but try to do semi-automated because you need to have manual delineation of the borders. This is very important, especially for the RV. Also now we have dedicated softwares for the RV shape. However, as you can see, when there is pressure and volume loaded, you will need to use a little bit of your expertise to guide the software. How about RV strain? First of all, to mention that RV strain is very sensitive nowadays. This method does not rely on geometric assumptions and it is sensitive, it is rapid, it assesses not only systolic but also diastolic dysfunction of the right ventricle. And this is a, an example of 3D strain where that we start doing in, in 2010 uh, the, with the first of softwares. I've tested all the softwares for strain. And this is a 3D strain that we did in bariatric patients again before and after surgery. And we saw how from diastolic dysfunction that they had in six months, the right ventricle improved significantly. Um, and then how about the contractile reserve? Uh, it's very important when we perform stress echo. And I want to mention that because nowadays we use it more and more. It seems that it's a prognostic marker for mitral valve operation, for even uh, when a patient will, for example, to assess heart failure patients. And we assess tricuspid velocities. Sometimes here in this study, they inject cardiovascular imaging, they assess the eccentricity index. And also it's important, we don't use TAPSI because as I said, it's load dependent but it's important to see the pulmonary pressures and the contractile reserve of the right heart. So here it's important for outcomes. And this uh, study started in 2016, measuring TAPSI. However, as I said, it's very risky to assess TAPSI because it may be pseudo normalized when it comes to, to stress echo. So be careful when you assess patients with significant tricuspid regurgitation, because when tricuspid regurgitation will increase during this, the last phase of stress and you take the TAPSI, it will be pseudo normalized. How right ventricle is affecting cardiomyopathies? We know that when we have biventricular impairment, then as you can see, the uh, survival for patients is much worse when we have only left heart affected. And this is important because that's why we need to have a proper assessment of the right heart. And this is a short table that you will see how actually the, the changes uh, when we have tricuspid regurgitation that we have only in dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathy when compared to constrictive and hypertrophic that you will see only mitral regurgitation, but also the, the balance between left side heart failure and right side heart failure. In restrictive and constrictive cardiomyopathies, you will have a predominant component of right side heart failure. Then uh, this is a great uh, landmark paper by Javier Sanz 
uh, in Jack in 2009 that has an overview of the right heart. Uh, I would suggest highly to, uh, to, to, to have a look at this paper. And it explains the myopathic process when it comes to the cardiomyopathic right ventricle uh, when compared to normal right ventricle pressure loaded and volume loaded. And this is a great overview explaining the hemodynamics as well as pathology. Here, the first uh, stage that we learned from animal models, uh, from this is a study from the NIH in 2015, but it's very important because we know now that when a study is dilates, then it will start compensating and it will reach to a phase that it has failed and it has established impairment and it cannot go back to normal. And that's why we assess a, a ventricle because we need to know the volume pressure loading and also when it has reached to a point that the RV failure is not reversible. And this is also another paper on the definition and treatment of arrhythmiogenic cardiomyopathy. And this is an example of strain that we performed in cardiomyopathic uh, right ventricle. And you will see the extensive impairment of the layers of the right ventricle. Going further, and I'm, I'm soon about to finish, uh, I want only to mention the rising subspecialty, the cardio-oncology, and how the, inf the medication that we use for cardio-oncology will affect the right heart mechanics and pulmonary circulation. So we have four major medicines, anthracycline, transtuzumab, dasatinib, and cyclophosphamide that will affect the, the, the ventricle, the right ventricle. And here is how they end up uh, describing the RV remodeling with oxidative stress, reversible and irreversible consequences of the right heart impairment. So it's very important to know that the sudden, for example, causes RV impairment through anti-proliferative agents that it is the satinib, and it's in, associated with increased PA pressures and pulmonary vascular remodeling. So it seems that uh, it's very important those medicines that they encourage the development of pulmonary hypertension in those patients with cardiotoxicity. And it seems that certainly affects right directly the right ventricle, sometimes without affecting left heart. This is the chemotherapy induced RV remodeling. It comes through reactive oxidative stress, neurohormonal changes, and uh, pro inflammatory markers such as interleukins. So and this is important to understand because there are studies now using strain and they described actually early changes of the RV with circumferential strain, but longitudinal strain, but also cardiac MRI within three or six months after therapy initiation. Finally, these are the studies that they have actually described RV systolic function and RV diastolic function, and they have used RV mechanics. And here is, are the modalities that they have used to describe, for, for example, echo, echo combination with nuclear or cardiac MRI. Reaching the end of uh, this presentation, first of all, I would like to remind everybody the multimodality assessment of the right heart. For you that you have only echo, believe me that if you use all the tools and all the indices that you, you, you need, you can actually have a perfect assessment of the right heart. You can give all the information to your surgeon or to your interventionist. And you need to give a full description because RV assessment is fundamental in uh, the prognosis and the outcomes of the patient. I would like to thank actually Sri Lanka College of Cardiology for this invitation. And I would like, for example, we have a webinar tomorrow if you would like to, on, on uh, my track left and clip. Uh, and uh, I would like to invite also all of you to participate to the journal. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Julia, for your excellent presentation on the right ventricle assessment and the prognosis and the diagnostic criteria of uh, all the right ventricle findings, uh, given a comprehensive description of uh, RV. And uh, we thank you for on behalf of the College of Cardiology. And we have a few questions from the audience. And we have some time left behind since you are our last lecturer uh, for this event. Uh, we can spend some time with you. Uh, there is a question. What are the echocardiography findings of patients with RV infarctions? That's a great question. So you need to be very careful again to go apical four chamber view and use all your tools to get a non-axis view uh, from the lateral side. 
assess the whole of the RV, but also do the three chamber and two chamber, most likely you will see the inf you will have combination of inferolateral wall motion abnormality of the left heart and also RV impairment. When compared to RV infarction, if you have an RV impairment and you suspect whether it's RV refaction or another pathology such as usually we have PE, pulmonary embolism, in pulmonary embolism, you will see a dilated right ventricle, acutely dilated. Sometimes remember the McCallan sign that the apex is vigorous in movement and the rest is profoundly hypokinetic. In RV infarction, it's globally down, it's globally impaired. You will see also that the RV most likely has its normal shape so it's not dilated or volume loaded or pressure loaded. So it's a normal shape. You don't see it hypertrophied, but significantly impaired. We had actually, and also I want to mention something important for the young people listening. When you have an inferior infarct or sometimes an inferolateral uh, aneurysm that you will see, the ejection fraction through Simpsons will be normal. And why is that? Because the ejection fraction takes the biplane that you will see the four apical chamber view. And therefore it doesn't take into account the inferior wall. It's actually a, a tip that we give when we assess the ejection fraction. So don't think that you see an apical four chamber view, it's normal, the ejection fraction is normal. We go inferiorly to look at the inferior wall. Uh, so it's, this is the important features of RV assessment. It will have a combination of most likely some left ventricular wall motion abnormalities together with right heart impairment. Thank you. Now, in the absence of tri uh, tricuspid regurgitation, and what about the pulmonary uh, acceleration curve? Uh, how well it is correlated to uh, calculate the pulmonary pressure or the right ventricular pressure? Thank you for this uh, great question. So I, I worked actually seven years in the pulmonary hypertension center, and we used to scan pulmonary hypertensive patients all the time. We had a lot of patients that they had, they didn't have significant tricuspid regurgitation, not even trivial. And however, these patients had the highest pressures. And these patients with no tricuspid regurgitation, but very high RVSP, had the better prognosis when compared to those with severe tricuspid regurgitation and lower uh, RVSP. When we have even a trace or zero tricuspid regurgitation, we always need to put the continuous wave Doppler across the tricuspid or the pulse wave Doppler across the RVOT. And we will always have a signal. Every human being in this planet has a tricuspid regurgitation velocity. So when a sonographer comes to me and he says, oh, the patient did not have significant tricuspid regurgitation, that's why I didn't do the tricuspid regurgitation velocity through the Bernoulli equation, I say, go back, take the continuous wave Doppler, and they find the good wa uh, wave form. So this is important because that's a teaching point. It took me a few months to understand the difference, but it's very different. The tricuspid regurgitation jet, as per se, when compared to the tricuspid regurgitation velocity. Everybody has tricuspid regurgitation velocity. No, I was talking about the pulmonary valvular acceleration time. Also, this is important because when we do the RVOT, we take the pulse wave Doppler, and this is not affected by the tricuspid regurgitation because it has to do with the RVOT. So when you take actually the first windows, you do the parasternal long axis, you take the right ventricular inflow, and as you rotate to go to the to see the RVOT, you take the, uh, the, pulm the pulse wave Doppler, and then you measure your first acceleration time. If you have, of course, atrial fibrillation, you will have to calculate five waves and take the mean of that. Yeah, there's another question from the audience. What is the role of RA strain in diagnostic, diagnostic prognostic assessment of the right heart? Right, atrial so strain. The, it is a, it's a great question because it has started uh, like the last five years, becoming a significant marker for patients with heart failure. There are actually heart failure studies that they mention RA strain as a parameter. Uh, it, is, it is very important. It's very easy to measure. And I just, I didn't mention that for the sake of time because I want my lecture to be on time. But it is a, it's a very, uh, it's a rising prognostic index. 
there's another small one uh, question is there any row uh, any relation between thyrotoxicosis with rv functions so from uh, the literature it has been proved that thyrotoxicosis may affect transiently the rv but it doesn't cause meaning to create some impairment by ventricular impairment but however it is reversible so if you treat the thyrotoxic and this is we are we are talking about severe situations and usually it's coming from arrhythmias atrial arrhythmias that will happen with thyrotoxicosis and then will affect actually the bed of the right heart we have another virtual uh, question coming up uh, acceptance of patients for redo mitral valve surgery when pulmonary hypertension is severe what is the best marker to proceed or not proceed so when you will actually uh, describe the right ventricle for your surgeon you said that the pulmonary hypertension is severe so you already know the right ventricular systolic pressure and then uh, you will give them to the surgeon the if the right heart is the right heart dilated is it pressure loaded is it impaired and then uh you will actually have the you didn't describe the degree of tricuspid regurgitation is that the tricuspid annulus dilated also i would give them the isol volumic relaxation time and if the tricuspid regurgitation is not significant less than moderate i would also give tapsi or the s wave and the myocardial performance index we used to when we again we in this in the hammersmith and also here at st thomas's we try to be very descriptive to our, our surgeons and we try to imagine the right heart if the let's say this the tricuspid regurgitation is significant we try to imagine how is the right ventricular bed the right ventricular chamber without this regurgitation so when you will operate because the surgeon wants to know when you will operate this patient will i have right ventricular failure so will be the operation successful operation and then unfortunately i will my patient will die because the imager did not tell me that the, this ventricle is not good to start with so this is an important question and i believe that we can help we need to you to be a team and work with each other and describe to our surgeons what's happening now uh, there's one more practical question in an icu setting if you need to replace fluid what are the parameters we would look for in the right ventricle so i guess that they mean that the patient is mechanically ventilated so definitely you cannot use the ivc as a prognostic marker um i would trust actually the right atrium if it's dilated or not but again it's influenced by the mechanical ventilation um but i would trust the rv i would trust also the lv because first of all when we have an underfilled patient you will go and see an rv that is collapsing uh, and when you see the rv is collapsing as per se or the lv you say the patient is underfilled you need to fill in 2 liters or you know just mentioning an a number so i think it's a combination of the of the ventricles lv and rv and they say not to trust the ivc because it influ it's influenced by the mechanical ventilation you can always take the ivc but if you remember the limitation the technical limitation okay thank you uh, any questions from the audience all right in the absence of any more questions professor julia thank you so much for your contribution and giving uh, all these deliberations with your excellent uh, presentations and and answers to all these questions thank you so much on behalf of sri lanka college of cardiology participating for our sessions thanks thank you very much stay safe have a great day bye bye yes yeah ladies and gentlemen this concludes the interventional cardiology program for today uh, a couple of uh, messages uh, the president of the sri lanka college of cardiology would like to invite the attendees uh, onto the stage to take a photograph um, and also the inauguration of uh, um, uh, uh, the inauguration program will also commence later in the evening today uh, and i would like to thank all the virtual guests for attending today's uh, meeting and also remind them that the main sessions of the sri lanka college of cardiology uh, the sessions will commence tomorrow morning at 7:30 uh, sri lanka time thank you